morning. It's Thursday, 20, uh, February 25th, 2021. We're taking up H, uh, S25 and act relating to miscellaneous cannabis regulation procedures. Um, we've gone over the bill with legislative counsel. Much of the bill is technical amendments to <clears throat> the bill that we passed last year, S54. I can't remember what the act number was. Um, and that, so uh, we're now taking testimony on proposed amendments from various individuals. Um, last, so uh, the first witness this morning is Graham, um, and I can't pronounce his last name. Uh, I do my best, I try, but I'm just going to refer to him as Graham, and he can introduce himself. Thank you for being here, Graham. Thank you, Senator, and thank you for inviting me. My name is Graham Unanks Trufenacht. I'm the policy director at Rural Vermont, and I'm also a farmer in the, in the Palace Plainfield Marshfield area. Um, so again, I appreciate you all having myself and our coalition partners in today. I believe I spoke with this committee two years ago about um, what the time was S54. And we've spoken a little with um, Senator White and Senator Sears over the last couple months um, about some of our concerns as a coalition related to agricultural access and equity and economic equity and racial equity um, in this bill and how we might be able to um, have some of our concerns addressed through the legislative process as well as the rulemaking process. Um, in terms of S25, you know, I don't think there's anything in there that um, our coalition uh, opposes, you know, from the town opt-in requirements to uh, the CCB um, deciding about integrated licenses. Um, we do have a number of our own amendments related to racial equity and disproportionately impacted communities, which I believe Mark will speak to later, um, that will be coming in a bill, which he will, he will be able to tell you more about. Um, and what we explained to Senator Sears um, a couple of days ago is that we expected all of our agricultural and economic equity provisions to also be included in a bill that, um, that includes those racial equity provisions. And unfortunately, they weren't. So we're sort of left in a position um, in which we have a number of concerns and bullets and, and findings and work that we put into this. Um, and we don't have it in the most accessible form for you. And for that, we apologize. Um, but what I'd like to do is at least go through some of our concerns. And um, we also and quickly also say that we've spoken to both the Senate and House Agricultural Committees, as we'd really like to have an opportunity for our members, farmers, cultivators to speak to those committees. Um, We've not had, to some extent, it feels like we're getting a little bit of a, a runaround in terms of how we are able to get in front of those committees and get our members to actually have a chance to speak to people who have the expertise to sort of understand sort of the farm and agricultural and economic access issues related to agriculture that we'd, we'd like to get into. But in lieu of that, um, I could at least speak to you here and um, we'll continue to press the agricultural committees. I'm also speaking with House members, Representative Ansel and others to try to find ways for our concerns to be heard. Um, so I'll just quickly just go through some of our some of our concerns and um, to be entirely um, transparent as well, I am required to be in another meeting at this time. So once I once I speak and if you have any questions, I'll take them then, but then I will be leaving the meeting to attend well, um, another meeting. We all understand that. Um, okay, I appreciate that. Um, so just really quickly, um, you know, from the agricultural perspective, um, we understand there were concerns which led to at the last minute um, cannabis being considered a non-agricultural crop. And I think there, we'd like to speak a little bit to, to, to our concerns around that. Um, you know, we propose a craft licensing structure and cost of craft licenses. We also recognize and realize that you all have been um, discussing recently the delay in implementation and some of the concerns around you know, how we're going to have discussions about licenses, fees, and all the things we need to this session. So I hope that um, some of what we've offered here, um, and I've, I've forwarded some of it to, to Senator Sears, um, is is helpful in those conversations you are all having at arriving at some some um, outcomes related to fee structure, licensing structure, um, and other things that we we need to get accomplished before as implementation rolls out. Um, I think from an agricultural perspective, you know. As we see this, um, you know, the Vermont required agricultural practices define an ag product as any raw agricultural commodity that's produced principally on the farm. 
includes products prepared from raw agricultural ag commodities, principally produced in the farm. Um, from hemp to crops for alcohol, biofuels, these are all considered agricultural. Um, the Vermont State Ag Plan has multiple briefs about the critical nature of alcohol sales, the production of alcohol, the cultivation of hemp, and a lot of non-food products related to the state's agricultural future. Um, and we also recognize that you know, the communities that we represent, small farmers, homesteaders, um, they have skill sets related to this. And you know, some of them are already engaged in the existing economy. Um, and when this crop is made non, considered non-agricultural, it has a lot of impacts related to um, economic equity and access issues for the agricultural community. So when we think about um, agricultural easements, current use, these are valuations um, that affect people's ability to economically access land, um, access the ability to grow crops, which if this is considered non-agricultural, will put those folks at a disadvantage. You will not be able to grow this crop on land and agricultural easement in land in current use, except for the narrow provision um, currently allowed under 1,000 square feet of land if the land is not transferred, transferred and if the land is already in current use uh, prior to cultivation beginning. So we're just trying to help folks understand that there's gonna be some impacts on, on, on farmers in particular who have worked over decades to get land into current use, agricultural easements, et cetera, which helps them to economically afford to be able to farm. And I think with this crop in particular, we recognize that there is a real challenge in farm viability right now, not just in the dairy sector, but in all sectors in Vermont. And this is a crop that we really feel is has a high potential for farmers to be able to make more of a just livelihood in relationship to just as other people in the industry will. That doesn't mean that we think it should be treated like tomatoes or squash or any sort of saleable you know, food product from the farm, but similar to alcohol sales based on a farm, for example, down the road from me is um, Hooker Mountain Distillery and they sell their um, distilled spirits at their farm stand that are principally produced on their farm. They still need to go through the licensing process um, as any other um, person who sells alcohol would and um, follow those procedures etc. Um, and I'm happy to address and speak to some of the concerns brought up around nuisance, um, whether it be odor or around um, civil or criminal asset forfeiture, which Chair Partridge at the Agricultural Committee brought up with me. Um, and I'd love to see just some examples of those concerns playing out nationally, um, especially related to civil or criminal asset forfeiture. You know, then we get sort of into just, so we would, we, our ultimate goal is, to, you know, one of our goals is to have this declared an agricultural crop and to, rather than having this sweeping um, regulation, which says this will not be agricultural, let's look at what can we do to put scale appropriate regulations in place to make sure that this can be an agricultural crop, like other agricultural crops um, that are more risky, whether it's raw milk, whether it's on-farm slaughtered poultry, whether it's tobacco, whether it's alcohol ingredients, we can we can put some particular regulations on them that make it more appropriate but doesn't just eliminate the ability for a lot of farmers to be able to produce this crop on land that they have in agricultural reserve for agricultural use um we are um we also I'm gonna have, break in a second graham and make yeah. sure um i i don't know how to get you to the agriculture committee um they basically don't want to deal with this. Um, that's what I sense. Um, I'm happy to uh, redo what we did in current use in the Senate side in S25, if that helps to. Um, we had a much larger, we ended up settling with the house on a thousand square feet, which is so you, 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 and also the grandfathering in and all of that, which they. So I, I'm happy to, to look at going back to that if the committee wanted to. One, um, I would let, I, I, somehow we went to him and made that an agricultural product, did we not? Yes, and we have an apparatus set up for regulating it um, from seed to sale. So and what you're talking about is similar. Yeah, and in, in, in particular other states, the, the Departments of Agriculture also regulate cannabis sales in particular other states as well, and it's designated as, as an agricultural use in particular states. And in some states, they allow that to be determined at the municipal level, which I'm, I'm not endorsing necessarily, but I just think it's good to know that it, it this is how it's done in other states in some cases. Can, can, I, can I ask, Graham, can I just ask you a question? What you're talking about here is the, um, the regulations and the um, 
you know, comparing it to raw milk and uh, stuff, you're talking about regulations and limits around the sales of it. But if it's an agricultural product, there is no, no regulation around the, the growing of it. Uh, an agricultural product, agriculture has no zoning. Um, it doesn't have to abide by local zoning or anything. So there's a difference between um, regulations around selling but making it an agricultural product would mean that nobody can um, determine where it could be growing right next door to me on the empty lot there um, without any, any uh, zoning requirements. Or, and, and the other difference is that like with hops and stuff, they are not the product itself. So the temptate, the, um, the, the security of hops isn't a real, isn't very much of an issue because you have to do a lot to make it into liquor. But um, the security of marijuana, it's, a, it's an entirely different crop than hemp and hops. So I just um, point that out and ask about the, the uh, lack of any regulation for the growing part of it if it's an egg product. Yeah, you're, you're correct. I mean, the, re the regulation of the growing part would, would hopefully be tasked with agency of agriculture. And I think related to your to that question, though, we, we did um, suggest some parameters which would affect regulations uh, around the growing. Specifically, we suggest um, differentiating between indoor, outdoor, and mixed light cultivation. And the only cultivation we would recommend would be considered agricultural would be outdoor cultivation. Um, we also recommend production caps such that the maximum amount that anyone could grow would be an acre outdoor. So we're saying that this would make this a much more accessible industry. You would sort of decommodify the crop. You would allow a lot more people to access it. And you would put regulations such that the scale couldn't get very inappropriate. And it couldn't get to the point that we see giant hemp fields right now where you have 60 acres in plastic, um, which I think is a concern for a lot of environmental reasons, but also as you talk about just concerns for neighbors, et cetera. We've seen hemp plants stolen um, at the community level, yeah. et cetera. Um, you know, in terms of the security concerns, I, you know, there are some provisions written into the law about how to protect crops. Um, and I'm, I'm just curious to have that conversation more about, um, about safety and about some of the concerns related to it. And I'd be curious to hear how that's played out in other states as well. I don't know if other states have um, right to farm laws like we do. And that might be, a comparing them might be a little bit uh, tricky. Senator Baruth, how should uh, I, I, I wanted to second what Jeanette said um, and also um, what the witness is saying in a different place. So I take the point about current use and agricultural easements. I, I think that's a very valid concern, but I think um, Senator White is, is correct. And, and my introduction to Vermont agriculture was sitting with Bobby Starr for two years on the agriculture committee, my first session. And, you know, one of the things Bobby drilled into me over the years was that you can't tell farmers how to grow their crops or you know, there's a, there's a sovereign um, view of the farm. And I think that's sacred to a lot of Vermont farmers. I think we would run into endless problems trying to create a, a secure and regulated growing environment if, if this were a purely agricultural product and the coalition that got the bill and got it all the way through to law and is now looking to reform it, part of what they had to give up along the way was the idea that growers would have complete control over the environment. So, you know, there are controls established and that made certain people in the House and the Senate okay with voting for it. So at this point, it's hard for me to imagine that we would go back to a situation where you would say to, um, Vermont farmers feel free to grow cannabis as you like on your property. Um, and I, I just don't think we'd be very successful regulating or limiting the power of the farmer. So I, I appreciate that, Senator. Um, I never served on agriculture, so. Um, I have also. I, uh, I would suggest that we do what we can in S25 though. And I, I think we could go back to our version of the current use. I don't remember exactly what it was, but I think it was much more expansive. And I, I think that's, you know, 
anything that we do that forces us into big marijuana is it is going to go against what we're trying to accomplish here. And so I think things like current use are an advantage to the farmer. Maybe we can't do what in S25, what, what Graham and others are asking us, but I think we can at least plant the seeds. That was a bad, <laughs> <laughs> I think at least we can make some movement on a few things and then have a, a separate bill for next year that does some of the other things that, you know, it's hard to believe that we're uh, a week and a half from crossover and have to pass these bills out. And I understand and I can certainly sympathize with the frustration on the good news is things got slowed down so bad that I, that I think next year would still be timely to uh, some of this more complicated stuff. Well, I do really appreciate hearing, hearing the concerns expressed. And I, I think, you know, one of my, I think this is a great reason why it would be great to have this conversation in the agricultural committee where we could speak to, you know, we could have a conversation about how we could create regulation. Um, and I do understand that there will be concerns and there may just be different disagreements about, about levels of risk and, and what the benefits are. Um, but I'll just quickly um, go through a couple of other things that we're suggesting here. And, and in terms of the, you know, the commodity scale cannabis, I really think that the something for you all to look at is um, our production caps and is some sort of supply management. I think that would really um, increase access uh, across the board for smaller cultivators. It would, it would make sure that we don't have certain types of um, players essentially engaging in this industry in Vermont. The, the profit motive and the profit exploitation motive wouldn't be there if, if the cap on production in, um, were there. Um, I also urge you to look into differentiating between outdoor mixed light and indoor cultivation. Because for example, when we currently have things like a thousand square feet of production allowed for the cultivator, small cultivator license, it doesn't differentiate between that. And there's essentially a scale of like four to one throughout the course of a year of what can be produced in an indoor environment versus an outdoor environment based on what we've heard from cultivators across the country and from our partner, Vermont Growers Association. So I think there's some interesting ways we could look at um, regulating scale um, to affect some of the concerns here. So we suggest a craft license tier. You know, this is already in the legislation. There will be craft licenses, and I don't need to get too far into it. But it's essentially a, a tier of small farmers, small retailers, et cetera, who can sort of can only source from each other, um, and they they're really limited in their scale. Um, we also propose, you know, a small farm craft license, and this gets into what Senator White was saying, and Senator Baruth, and related to that. To you know, if you have a product principally produced on the farm, you are allowed to sell that product on the farm. Um, this would essentially be a craft license where, again, you'd have a lot of restrictions and um, regulations in place to ensure the safety and security of that product. But you're essentially saying this farmer can, if, with you know, fewer requirements and costs than a normal retail outlet, be able to sell from their farm under, it, it would, um, provided they meet X, Y, or Z conditions. Um, we also just talked about you know, including the different types and different times of the licensing process. And I'll leave that to, I think, um, my, our coalition member, Jeffrey, to speak to, because he can speak to it better than me. And lastly, we just, we've really put in some concerns around the regulatory body in the CCB. We noticed that there's really not a process for members of the CCB to be removed. Um, there's really not much ability for the advisory committee to have an active role. Um, so we suggested that um, the advisory committee have some ability to veto decisions made by the CCB and also some ability to remove members of the CCB or somebody have that ability. Um, and I think, you know, for my concerns, I might, I might leave it there and let my, my partners speak to the rest of what we've brought forward. Senator, Senator White has a question. I realize you've got to go yeah. to another meeting. Graham, just, just quickly. Um, I, I believe that the legislature has the um, veto ability for anything that the Cannabis Control Board, um, they have to come to us with their recommendations and we approve. So there is a veto ability and, for the way I understand that it's structured. And Jeanette, maybe you can check me on this, but I thought that the governor had the power to remove board members for cause. Uh, no, the no? only way the, according to the statute, the only way there's three board members and the only way they can, one can be removed is with the other two removing that person. Oh, I see. Okay. And, yeah. and is that only for cause? Like negligence or? It doesn't say, it just says that the only way they can be <clears throat> removed. So if two people on the board think that somebody is being obstructive or um, doing 
horrible things, they have the right to remove that. Wow, that's, I, I would be in favor of looking into that because I think in, in other boards where they're appointed by the governor, if somebody is perennially missing meetings, um, <clears throat> neglecting the job, something like that, they can be removed with a hearing um, and they have the right to make a defense. But if the other two board members can just vote for any you know, reason. I think, I think that's all it says in the in the statute, but I think that that's certainly something that can, Michelle, Michelle has a, yeah. yeah. Michelle can help us with this. Sure, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, you remember the evolution of this section was that when you created the board originally in S54, you wanted it to be an independent uh, entity so that you, you didn't want, you wanted to uh, kind of isolate the board somewhat from um, kind of political wins, depending on who is in the administration at the moment. Um, that changed somewhat with regard to the appointment authority and things like that once it was in the house. But the provision that made that still made it through, which was what you had in the original S54 was that a member may only be removed uh, only for cause. So oh, okay. it, it, it is cause is required by the remaining members of the commission in accordance okay. with the APA. And so it does have to be for cause, but there, um, and you can obviously change this if, if you reconsider, but your, but your original thing was that you didn't want it to be that maybe a board member was taking certain actions. They were, uh, that the, maybe the, whoever is the, the governor at the time didn't agree with maybe politically or something. And so you wanted to, um, to insulate that process a little bit. Thanks. Thanks. Graham, uh, oh, Senator Benning, I, I, I'm mindful that Graham needs to leave. So if yeah, you that's not Graham. for Graham necessarily, but I wanted to jump in on this part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, so if Graham has to go, that's okay. It wasn't something I was gonna ask of Graham. I just wanted to remind folks that we received a letter from the governor way back when <clears throat> one of his issues was the board members and uh, the administration was upset. I'm reading from it now. Board members are now only removable for cause by the other board members. This removes the board from accountability to the governor and constitutes an unconstitutional usurpation of the governor's constitutional duty to faithfully execute the laws. This is a provision that exposes all of the work of the board to legal challenges. So this area is probably ripe for some conversation that we might want to provide a clear I think path that, how they can be removed. With all due respect to uh, the Judiciary Committee members, I think that's a government operations issue more than judiciary. And, uh, <laughs> although it is a constitutional issue, I suppose, where um, frequently, uh, this particular administration um, has um, thrown up constitutional barriers that I haven't seen in my other years here um, on a variety of things. And uh, I, I won't go into the detail of them. And I, I, I disagree I with the, the constitutional the, issue. I'm looking well, at the constitution well, right now. Yeah. Well, I, I do too, but I... I <clears throat> There was a reason that we made, we, the, mm -hmm. I think that the government operations committee level wanted to make this independent, similar to the way we have an independent defender general. Well, and if, if the governor still retains the power to appoint, and those are limits on the terms of those people, it's not as though the governor doesn't have a lot of power over the board. Anyway. Uh, any other questions for Graham or Graham? Do you have any other comments for us? <clears throat> no, thank you for your time. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take my opportunity to leave and get into this other meeting and, and hand it over to my coalition partners. But thank well, you all. Stay, um, stay in touch. I will. I do what we can here. Um, okay, Jeffrey. Welcome to Senate Judiciary this morning. Thank you, Senator. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Excellent. I do have some prepared remarks, which I am going to read, uh, and then I'll, uh, they'll be brief, and I'll just go into some uh, comments and take questions afterwards, if that's fine. That's fine. All right. 
Uh, I don't know if Graham's here anymore. Thank you, Graham. That was fantastic. I appreciate it. Hard to follow up with that. Um, so good morning, senators. Thank you for the opportunity to address your committee today uh, to speak to Bill S-25 uh, and the language, uh, the sort of loose amendments we would like to introduce uh, to uh, bring resolution to racial, small business, and the agricultural inequities that currently exist in Act 164. 2020, uh, as outlined by our coalition in the language um, that we sent over to you guys, and also as outlined as, as has been mentioned earlier this morning already uh, by the governor last year in his what we're calling uh, the non-signing statement. Um, it is our belief uh, as a coalition that all of these uh, in inequalities must be addressed together and at the same time to successfully begin to bring redress and move Vermont beyond the failed war on drugs, but also to arrive in a just and equitable cannabis marketplace. One that is innovative, accessible, craft centric, and uniquely Vermont. Uh, for the record, uh, we're sort of the, the new kids in the block. Uh, so uh, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Pizzatello. Uh, I'm a professional cannabis grower. Uh, I'm also the co-founder and the executive director of Vermont Growers Association. Uh, we're a C4, a social welfare nonprofit, and we serve as the trade association for uh, the state's cannabis professionals. Basically, think of us as the Vermont Brewers Association back during the 1990s with Greg Noonan and when him and his cohorts were seeking the craft beer marketplace that we basically enjoy today. Uh, so that's us. Um, we study state cannabis law. Uh, we network with other state cannabis organizations. We connect with regulators in other states on an all important <laughs> basis. Uh, with that said, uh, a large percentage of our membership and our advocates are the state's illicit actors that want to transition into a legal marketplace. Uh, some of them are BIPOC. Many of them are low income, socially disadvantaged, felons with past nonviolent cannabis convictions, basically poor white people and people of color. Uh, and that's why I just wanna take a moment and say, I'm so proud of our coalition that we have uh, with the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, NOFA Vermont, rural Vermont and Trace, because we basically represent that fusion politics in the cannabis space in Vermont. We're united by our shared interests in seeking just and equitability, and also more importantly in recognizing that BIPOC have been disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs. Um, again, all of these inequalities must be addressed together, we feel, and at the same time, other states have laid this groundwork. It is possible and now is the time to get it done in Vermont. And so thank you again. Uh, I will speak for a moment uh, about uh, social equity before I go into uh, some of the agricultural uh, concerns that, that Graham had highlighted a moment ago. Uh, just to share some stats with you guys. Um, by the end of 2020, the emerging legal cannabis industry in the United States was estimated to be valued at around $40 billion and responsible for about 320,000 new jobs, according to Leafly. Uh, of those stats, only about 4% uh, of that industry is black owned businesses. So a $40 billion industry, just over 4% black owned ownership. Uh, that is what systemic racism looks like. Uh, this is a new industry. This is an opportunity. Um, and that 4% ownership is a tragic number. Vermont, Vermont's new law does not include a social equity program as you guys are aware, and that's one reason why we are here today. I will say that is unique for 2020. It is now commonplace for cannabis legislation to include a social equity program. It is uncommon not to include one. With Act 164, Vermont is going down that path, senators, that status quo 4% ownership path, unless we change course now. Now is the time, this year is the time to be implementing this and not simply including a social equity program, but rather refocusing and recentering uh, social equity and restorative justice as our priorities for the state, for our new adult use marketplace. Other states are doing this, as you guys know, Illinois, Massachusetts is, is exploring this with uh, some innovative licensing. California has this uh, at various municipality levels, Oakland notably. 
uh, New Jersey uh, is rolling out a, they just passed uh, tax and regulate. They're rolling out a social equity program at the start of their program. And they're finding success and we don't wanna be left behind. Um, so as a partner in a statewide coalition, our organization, the Vermont Growers Association, supports the language put forth by the Racial Justice Alliance to refocus equity and justice in our emerging marketplace. Uh, moving over to small business and agricultural inequities. Vermont cannot arrive at a just and equitable legal marketplace without also addressing the small business and agricultural inequities that exist in Act 164. As also outlined by the governor's non-signing statement, quote, a primary concern is the licensing construct which will disproportionately benefit Vermont's existing medical dispensaries by giving them sole access to integrated licenses and an unfair head start on market access. He goes on, this creates an inequitable playing field held both for our smaller minority and women-owned businesses and other small growers and entrepreneurs. So right now, the illicit cannabis businesses in the, in the state of Vermont largely, unfortunately, do not see themselves in this law. So if transitioning illicit businesses into this legal space is a concern, now's the time to address that. Clear uh, and fair land use, as uh, my colleague Graham had mentioned, and farmland regulations that make sense for our farming community. We are, after all, an agrarian state uh, to allow for reasonable, not again, uh, wild, wild west tomatoes, but reasonable regulation. And I do point to California, Massachusetts, Maine, and other states that are doing this, which I look forward to exploring with you guys. Um, but also defining cannabis cultivation not as a commercial activity, specifically, uh, we suggest that should be removed. Um, moving on, equality and equity in licensing is also central to this perspective that's shared throughout the uh, cannabis community with regards to 164. Uh, the marketplace is not accessible to them. And so that's why our coalition proposes language with clear definitions for accessible and fair licenses for everyday Vermonters. Act 164 is filled with a lot of these so-called kind of to be determined clauses. Uh, one of them is the craft license. Uh, page 26, I forget the actual number. Uh, there is a clause that says, you know, we will look to develop craft delivery license, craft, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what we do is we took feedback from Vermonters over the past year. We researched and consulted with other states and regulators and advocates. And we built out, as Graham had alluded, very thoughtful craft licensing in our language that will reform Act 164 and address directly the small business and agricultural inequities that currently exist. Look at Massachusetts, look at Oklahoma, parts of California, Oregon, they all show us the importance of fair and just licensing and what that has in the viability overall of an adult use marketplace. Uh, also critical to addressing the small business and agricultural inequities uh, is uh, accountability, as we had also mentioned, uh, in the CCB. Uh, I won't uh, uh, say what uh, the governor had left in his signing statement. I believe that uh, Senator White had just mentioned that, or maybe that was Baruth, I apologize. Uh, but his criticisms of the CCB, we share. And we do think that, and it sounds like there may be agreement uh, today, that that is an area that uh, is worth looking into. And I just bring up one anecdote. Uh, we see other states have dealt with this, and that is issues with the regulatory body uh, and its impacts on rollout and formation. Notably in Michigan, Michigan had a similar bill as ours years ago. They developed a state uh, level commission that was appointed by the governor, selected by their legislative body. And after about a year and a half of operations, Michigan ultimately needed to dissolve that commission because it turned out that one of the commissioners on that body was a little too close to the dispensaries and, and their rollout, their market rollout was grinding to a halt. And so they dissolved that commission, they corrected that and they, they're now moving towards at a, at, at, a, at a more reasonable pace. So just to echo that concern uh, as, as my colleague did a moment ago, um, 
And that basically concludes uh, my, written, my written remarks, but I do want to follow up just briefly um, and add that a lot of our language uh, is designed to mitigate and eliminate a lot of the concerns that we are now hearing, um, not just from your body, but from other elected officials throughout the Senate and the House with regards to Act 164's implementation and formation process. I've watched every committee hearing on uh, S25 to date. Um, and in some of your meetings, uh, you guys, senators have rightly so expressed numerous times uh, concerns about rollout, how well-intended bills in other states flounder uh, at formation. And we see that happening in this state with Act 164. And now is the time to take preventative measures to prevent that. A lot of our language that we, we hope you guys will adopt uh, will seek to eliminate those issues that we think will only increase unless we take action this year. So we share those concerns in implementation and formation. We share those concerns that you're expressing about what is legislative responsibility, what is rulemaking responsibility. A lot of what we're proposing is what other states are enacting at the legislative level. Licensing is a legislative priority. So thank you for your time. Uh, and I'll take your questions if you guys have any. Senator White. So uh, thank you. I'm curious about your um, comments about the control board and how you would structure that. And I found it very interesting that if in, I think you said Michigan where one person was, um, instead of just kicking that person off, they just dissolved the whole commission. And so I, I'm just, cause I'm on the nominating committee and we have sent just sent names to the governor. And I can tell you the people that we interviewed are um, very serious about this and are um, looking to do their very best. So I just would wonder how you would restructure the Cannabis Control Board. Well, uh, thank you for that question. Um, I think it can be as simple as, and we want to stay simple and reasonable and realistic because it's important for us to get these reforms passed this year because we are in implementation formation. So timeliness is relevant here. So uh, we're not suggesting necessarily a reconfiguration of the board in so much a little more accountability vis-a-vis -vis what Graham had mentioned, which is allowing the state to adjust for these issues if they come up, because we have seen in other states that they do in fact come up. You know, it is a multi-billion dollar industry. We should not be surprised with special interests. It's just part of this country. So we need to navigate around that. And we're not implying that the board as of this moment is, is corrupt. No, we're trying to be preventative because of what I, we've seen in other states. I still don't understand how you would reconstruct it so that, because it does, the accountability is to the legislature <laughs> or the board. Well, there would be and, an advisory committee, I think. Well, there is an advisory committee. Right. So that's where the changes are. Right, exactly. Uh, we, we, we would, uh, in our language that we sent, uh, it does rely on the advisory committee to perform more of the accountability that we're seeing. <clears throat> so it wouldn't come to the legislature, it would go to the advisory committee? As of this moment, uh, and we're, we can explore that together to, to, to find out what's best for, for us, but I would say that would be a starting point. Hmm, okay. Mr. Chair, if I may. Yeah, where, what is the status of the advisory committee, Michelle, if you're still with us? So the uh, Act 164 required the advisory uh, committee to be seated by May 1st. That was premised on a, that the board was going to be seated by January 19th. And so the advisory committee works under the, under the authority of the board. Um, they do not have uh, so they are making recommendations and working with the board, but they don't have independent authority. I think what the witness is, is referring to is in his proposal, uh, he asks that the advisory committee have veto power over the board. Um, and uh, 
and a few other things. So that's, but they don't have anything like that now. Right now, that's it's comprised of, uh, I think, twelve members with varying expertise, and their job is to be assisting the board in developing the policy that's going to guide the rules and the and the application process. And how are they appointed? Remind me. The advisor. Um, it varies depending. So there's different. Uh, appointment authority. So some is by the speaker, some by the pro, by the committee on committees, the AG's office, etc. Yep, okay. and the governor. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Thanks. Peggy has posted on the website uh, Jeffrey's um, uh, outline of um, uh, which could be a legislative proposal, I guess, um, and kind of helpful to, to have that access to that outline that he, that he provided to the committee. Um, I, again, oops. yeah, the Senator Ruth. Yeah. Uh, sorry about that, Mr. Chair. So um, I guess I go back to um, the witnesses statement about timeliness. I agree, I think timeliness is of the essence. I, I think at this point, if we were to in essence, I think what you're suggesting is that we reverse the power dynamic between the advisory board and the cannabis control board. So in effect, the advisory board would become the one with the power um, in the equation. And that might, you know, that's a, a discussion that could be had. I think it would add quite a lot of time to the, to the calculus because we're, we're staffing now based on the idea that the people on the advisory board are purely advisory. And so they have expertise or, or whatever, but they were not selected with an eye toward hiring and firing um, the control board. So I, I think at this point, what you're talking about strikes me as kind of a, uh, not repairing the car, but putting in a new engine. And I, I think it can only add time to a process that is woefully behind time now. Um, so I think there are a slate of things that we would look at a couple of years down the road, and it may be that that's one of them. I'm satisfied now that I know that board members can only remove one another for cause, and the governor has the power to appoint, and then they're term limited after that. So, um, you know, I, I take your point. I just think it's, uh, it's, it's probably not the moment for addressing it. Thank you for that. Oh. Go ahead. I, oh, Michelle. Go ahead. I just wanted to add, I, um, just to remind everybody that the uh, advisory committee, those folks are per diem and expenses. They're not uh, employees of the state and they're not, and so they're not salaried or, or anything like that. So um, the only folks who are full-time employees are the three board members and the executive director and the administrative assistant, so. Jeffrey, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, no Jeffrey, problem. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, uh, Senator and Michelle. Uh, yes, uh, just stepping back for a moment, the, the intent here is to uh, help accelerate uh, and also meet the, the deadlines this year while providing a more thorough build out of the implementation formation, vis-a-vis -vis licensing structure, uh, land use, opening up agriculture for the agrarian state, or at least making it a little bit more accommodating for our farmers, uh, and also bringing accountability. So I take your note, uh, Senator Bruth, uh, if the accountability is there, uh, uh, satisfactory you know, threshold has been met, uh, that's fine. Uh, but I, I, I will say that you know what we're proposing is not intended to slow down. And so if it is seen that way, uh, that is not our intent, just to, just to underscore that. Um, so it is, you know, we see, look, studying other states, it took Maine about five years to arrive in adult use market. It took Massachusetts about three and a half. And that's after they open up and start issuing licenses. That's, that's at that point in time, the clock, the clock says go. And so, we have some of our members, for instance, uh, you know, I won't name any names, but some of the most reputable CBD and hemp storefronts in the state. And when they tell us they will need at least 
12 months after from the day they get their license to then participate in the marketplace. What does that say for the rest of Vermonters who are in that position? So that speaks to uh, how quickly, you know, that speaks to viability, that speaks to maturity of market, that speaks to success in rollout. We want to have a successful rollout. We want to include as many Vermonters as early as possible without slowing down this process. And so that's overall what we're proposing. And that also gets at a lot of our primary intent of this legislation. And I don't want to speak for you guys, which is to transition Vermonters out of that illicit market into that legal space. So this gets at that. Thank you. <clears throat> so many ways here, I feel like this committee is not the, so much of this has to do with agriculture, so much of it has to do with the, the government operations committees um, and um, finance. Uh, so I'm a little, thankfully we have Michelle here who understands this stuff backwards and forwards. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Appreciate the testimony and also the written um, document that you provide. Yep. Thank you, guys. Okay. Uh, Mark Hughes. Morning, Mark. Mr. Chair, morning, Senator Benning, Senator Nitka, Senator Bay Ruth, and Senator White. I'm Mark Hughes. I'm executive director of the racial equity. Uh, the racial, I think it's the racial equity. You know, you know what I am. Uh, the uh, I'm executive director of the Racial Justice Alliance and Justice for All. And uh, um, I just want to thank you for taking some time with us today. I'm here to discuss uh, S25 and also. Um, the bill that will be emerging from uh, the House to, that seeks to address the um, um, racial equity. So I, first of all, I just want to give a shout out to um, definitely NOFA and Growers in Rural and, and Trace. Uh, we've been with them, we've been working with them um, weekly. We meet on a weekly basis um, since probably last August. So maybe July or something like that. It's a serious uh, relationship, and I just wanted to let you know that the first thing we did is, is we sent we spent two sessions, which were each an hour and a half, um, covering uh, systemic racism. Um, I presented that, so that's how we got on the same page. That's where we started in our commitment to one another, because I know you see a lot of coalitions, you know, this is really worth the conversation. It's, I think this is really, really important to um, this coalition and the work that we're putting forward to you and in what you saw us doing last session with S54 and, and you saw fierce opposition to. Um, and uh, so what we, what we came up with was, is we thought it'd be a good idea to, to learn, I thought it'd be a good idea to learn about ag and I, and I thought it'd be, and they thought it'd be a good idea to learn about uh, systemic racism. So, and, and increasingly we're hoping to be able to um, further educate our constituents and to be able to bridge those, um, bridge those areas as well, because there's a lot in common. We discovered that we were pretty powerful um, because a lot of times um, you, um, the best, um, barometer is, is when, when people come after you, when you bring forward an idea, and uh, we were essentially uh, attacked uh, last uh, session uh, from all sides. Um, but we're glad to be here. We're glad the governor chimed in in his non-signing statement uh, at the end. We're glad that uh, you, Senator Sears, under your leadership, and also the willingness of uh, some others, uh, did circle around with us off session, uh, even as recent as just a couple days ago, having more conversations about this. We are appreciative. So thank you for that. You know, regarding systemic racism, I just wanted to say that I think that um, what I've seen and I too, you know, you know, God bless you too. You know, I've, I too have uh, been in and out of a lot of uh, committee meetings to include uh, committee meeting discussions in um, various committees across Senate and House. 
in conversations and I see uh, conversations about systemic racism and around systemic racism and many people just trying to still trying uh, still trying to um, uh, I guess prove that it exists almost like a global warming conversation uh, so um so yeah I, I just want to as far as what we're doing, the work that the Alliance is doing here, we're here in this area as a result of something we stumbled across uh, last biennium in Act 250. And that was, is that we came to understand that our land use law uh, had a 50 year review and there was not one word on racial equity in it. Not one. So, as uh, S54 emerged, that seemed to make sense. I drew, the, I drew the connection, we took some of the lead and then the, the work became a little, it made a little bit more sense. But, and now we're in the middle of a triple pandemic and there's a racial reckoning and we're still having this conversation. Um, what we wanted to see is more uh, language, uh, um, equity language in, in the policy. We put forward some um, recommendations. It, didn't it didn't necessarily happen until actually and I think it actually left your committee because if I'm not mistaken, you know, the language that we were uh, seeking to emulate came out of uh, Illinois, which was after what far after crossover, if I'm not mistaken, uh, but we were not able to track it down in house and then we know the rest of the story. So I just wanted to, um, you know, just go back to Senator Beirut's comment about uh, putting a new engine in this thing and, and, uh, and also um, um, this whole thing about time, because uh, time seems to never be on our side, because uh, it wasn't on our side last biennium towards the end of the session, because we were asking to slow this thing down so we can make more sense of it, so we can uh, get it out there in a way that made more sense. Uh, and now, since we, you know, were we were not successful in doing so, we're here on the other side, and there's still not enough time. So I'm wondering when in the hell there's going to be enough time at some point or another to actually get some of this work done. Um, but yeah, it, there is there is a new engine syndrome, and that that's kind of what we sidestepped because the the water's already under the bridge, if you know what I mean. As far as the structure of this thing, we've got serious concerns about structure and process uh, with this uh, with this particular uh, you know in this endeavor to get regulation <laughs> underway. But we're down the road; we've got it out of the gate. Uh, so now what we're doing is, is doing in-flight plane construction, and we're hoping to be able to get some get retrofitted with some um, some additional language. Now, I just want to pause here just for a second and just say briefly that every single aspect of what our my colleagues and my good friends have brought forward, uh, they're running in tandem with what I'm bringing to you right now. It's not a separate conversation. We haven't changed pages or anything like that. We're in full support of and would not like to go forward without these these uh, these requests that have been put before you with uh, with these folks. Uh, unfortunately, there's some other folks who couldn't attend. Um, and I just wanted to just backtrack a little bit because I know Senator Sears, you said that some of this stuff doesn't pertain to this uh, this uh, this committee. Um, and I, I saw um, my brother Graham's frustration and I continue to watch him going from committee co to committee, trying to figure out where his you know, grievances should lie or where his, um, his recommendations should be submitted. Um, and um, so I of all people can relate to that because there is no racial justice committee. Uh, and we've, we've been doing this for a while and Senator Sears with the Joint Justice Committee, you and I had some conversations after that. Um, and, you know, we're dealing with a structure of government, you know, that has had a, a habit of oppressing black and brown people since its inception that, was, that wasn't designed to accommodate us. And I think what they're doing is, is they're running up against the same issues. Uh, fortunately, we do have the government operations chair sitting in with us today. So that's a good thing. And if it's more appropriate to have those conversations relating to government operations in, the, in that committee, we, we love that invitation. We'd love to come uh, you know, over to have those conversations. Five, three things on uh, S25, the ballot question, social equity and the uh, percent of cannabis flower. Um, the, um, you know, I'll start with the percentage of cannabis flower and so forth, you know, you know, we, now I'm going to go to 
just what's going on over here at the Alliance. And I want to stay transparently. I haven't, we haven't, I haven't had this conversation with my colleagues on our coalition. Um, but I think they would agree. And I think largely they already have agreed that, that they're not really finding problem with this, but I think it's that that's largely, I think, I just want to comment just positively and, and just, uh, you know, compliment the uh, innovation. Uh, I thought, I think, I thought that's a good idea. I thought it was a good idea. I don't know where the numbers came from, but it's, it's awesome. Um, the, uh, and that's, I think that's over in um, page six. Yeah. Um, page, page six. It's um, lines 10 through line 10 12. 12 to 12. So that's, that's really good. Uh, it's backing up into social equity. Um, you know, I, I think, it, I think it's a start. Uh, it's, you know, I, I, I think it's a start in, in what I've sent over to you, you should have in your email right now, uh, is, is, I think is a place for to build upon uh, that, that type of language. Uh, it's definitely a start. Uh, it's beginning to go in the right direction. It's, it's better than where we started, uh, where we left off at last year. And as far as the ballot question is concerned, you know, you know, I, I view that as largely re reactionary. I don't even think it was an issue last year. I know we've done some local work here in, in Burlington. Um, I know Chris uh, <coughs> was, was at those meetings. I, he certainly wasn't happy uh, that, that what we were doing was just urging the city of Burlington to, um, to have an option to divide that question uh, for the purposes of delaying um, uh, market entry for the larger businesses to give smaller businesses an opportunity to get out in front of it. Uh, so I view this as mostly reactionary. Um, I honestly, I, I personally, from from Mark, I just think it, it's an example of the legislature coming back to in just response to um, activism that's happening in the community and just closing uh, what is uh, largely kind of maybe a loophole or something like that. So it's kind of disappointing. Um, that that's in there, but and it's also it seems as though it's it's. Uh, um, it's kind of it's kind of hard to get after because there's a lot of uh, uh, um, communities that have already pulled the trigger on that. So that's I see a lot of expressions on your faces right now. So I'll just pause right I'm there. To follow where you are. I, you my my expression is I'm trying to follow where I'm, you are. I'm talking about the Senate Senator White, really, but I was I wasn't. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. You're you're so, talking about the votes in 25 communities. Yeah. Um, no. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Is there something that you, is there a question that you had, Senator, Senator White? I'm glad to answer any questions that you have. Well, I was just going to say the reason that's in there is mm -hmm. because, because the um, compromise had towns doing an opt in instead of an opt out, the, the fear was that some towns would just never hold a, a, um, a vote and therefore, um, retailers, anybody who wanted to be a retailer would have no idea whether they could set up in that town or not. So this is a drop dead deadline telling them that they by a certain date, they need to have a vote or they will be um, a town that has that allows it. That's that's all Thank this you. is. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Chair, I just I just I don't I wanted to spend maybe a couple more minutes here, but I, I, I would like to check in with the chair to find out if if we had how much how much more time we had to to, to, to have this got half an hour. Well, it's not going to take that long. So I just uh, so yeah, that that's that's a that's yeah, I, I get it. I understand. Uh, this is you know this this question again, Mr. Chair. I think that the that the um the question is overly prescriptive. Uh, I think that the question is is it does uh, it, it does eliminate the ability for a town to put a question on a ballot that would give them the ability to, to in some way or another divide that question in the wake of the work that we've done here in Burlington to do exactly that, as well as many other cities and towns across the state. I won't belabor the point. I get what the Senator is telling me, but that's not what I came here to talk to you about. I just wanted to give you Mark's opinion on this policy right. and the response that was that happened with it. OK, yep. um, as far as this, um, what I put before you, um, and, and I would, Mr. Chair, I, 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 would I would love to entertain an invitation given the fact that we bifurcated the way in which we're addressing these issues. 
and I know that this is not the committee to have that particular discussion that I just went over, but uh, I would love to, you know, go into whatever committee of jurisdiction that has, and we can have more conversation about it. Um, and, but uh, again, it's, it's, it's just overly prescriptive. And, and I think it, it's uh, the, the premise in which it's, it, it's basically telling the cities and towns uh, what to do uh, in terms of uh, how they want to pose that question. Um, I, I'm assuming that the committee has received the um, the document that I just sent over. I don't, I don't have it on the committee web page right now. Okay. I just posted it. Okay, well then I gotta. You. What do I have to do? Refresh it. Uh, yes, that should work. Are we talking about uh, Representative Chino's language? That's correct. Okay. Okay. What about Representative? Uh, Representative Senator Ron's language. I don't have that language in front of me, but I, I can say um, um, just on behalf of the, the Racial Justice Alliance, uh, not the coalition, you know, I, I would say we are supportive of Representative Rahm's language. We would like a separate entity, a different entity besides the, um, the uh, Department of Public Safety being a, grant, uh, a granting entity. We think it kind of flies in the face of what it is that we're trying to do here. Uh, um, I know that there are a lot of white people with political and economic power that don't understand folks who have been uh, impacted, um, you know, systemically, systemically impacted, you know, by systems of oppression to include uh, those that are so-called public safety related. And that question would be who's, whose safety are you talking about? Because seemingly the more white people feel safe, the less black people feel safe. Uh, that's why I'll be in a uh, committee this afternoon over in um, the government operations, having that conversation with a legion of police that are rotating in that, that revolving door coming out of there. But uh, yeah, we don't really see a good reason why this should be administered by public safety. We it don't isn't. just like, we don't, well, the, the proposal that Senator Ram, uh, Ram put together, Mr. Chairman, uh, as it was my understanding that her original amendment had public safety to administer. And, and I'm, I'm fully aware of that because I've been in, in, in direct conversation with her. We're taking testimony on her proposal in our committee. Um, mm -hmm because I think that that was the agreement with Senator Sears. So we're taking testimony on that. And actually what she did is she asked that it be administered by somebody other than the training, than the Justice Council. And the Justice Council is not part of the Department of Public Safety, just yeah. for your information. Not yet. Uh, so, so yeah, the, the, but I am fully aware of what the Justice Council is and what they represent, and, and maybe I may have misspoken that particular area, but no, we have, we have no desire to have the Justice Council um, be the uh, grant entity. That was the original language. I am aware that she did uh, walk that back, but that was the original language, and that's what, I'm, that's what I was about. So here, here's where I'm getting confused, Senator White, um, now. Uh, Can you just... We have we, all, I've got so many proposals here that I'm totally, I just don't have the ability. I'm sorry. I may, I may not be the brightest guy in the world. Join the club. I know I'm not, but now I'm confused. <laughs> I have Mark's proposal, which is Representative Gina's Gina. propo proposal. We have Senator Rahm's, and you're taking Senator Rahm's proposal up this afternoon. We, we, our, my understanding was that we would accept for the um, whatever that section is that deals with the social equity yeah. um, section that 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 we would deal with the rest of the the issues and since her um, amendment was proposing the um, creation was proposing to um, really? commit oh. funds we right. took that up. It didn't, it wasn't right. part of that social equity thing. So, but I'm happy to do it in here if you want to. No, I, I don't care. I, as long as it gets done. We've taken some testimony and we're taking um, more right. this week. Um, go ahead, Mark. So, um, so imagine the confusion of the activists. Uh, that there is no, yeah. there is no, there's mm -hmm. def definitely no uh, committee for, like I said, for racial justice, but you know, uh, what, I had to jump off earlier because I was on on taking a call with Tom Stevens as well. So we're trying to cover all of this. You know, this, this you know, to, if systemic racism really exists, if it exists anywhere, it exists everywhere. So we're we're trying to we're trying to figure this out. Maybe we should restructure the government. Government, I don't know. 
but uh, I would like to be able to at least do this effectively. Uh, so what we'll talk about now is, is racial equity and everything that I've heard so far leads me to believe that I've landed in the right committee to have that conversation. So um, if you uh, humor me for a minute and, and turn over to page, uh, uh, let's see here. I want to go to chapter tw uh, 39 and just talk a little bit about definitions, which, you know, which we uh, I think is really important. One, one second, Mark. Yeah. Chapter 39 being? That's uh, page three of 20. My, my okay. apologies. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. So, so we want, I just wanted to, I'm not going to read all of these to you, um, but, but I, I just wanted to just make it clear. We, we are defining agency. We are defining center. Di we, are, we are defining, importantly, disproportionately impacted areas. Um, there's, um, there's, so there, so we can make sure that we're, we're talking about um, the same thing, member of an impacted family, um, program board, um, the whole idea of where people have resided, where they reside and so forth. So, and I, and I think the, the challenge that we're having with this kind of policy is, is that I would think we have this, I think there is a tendency to want to try to take a look at the uh, regulation of an industry, whatever the industry is, and saying, okay, did, you know, this weed hurt somebody and who is that? And trying to find out who they are. Uh, and, uh, and also, you know, and, and I think a lot of times that helps that, you know, that does two things. We miss the fact that systemic racism hurt a lot of people and this played into it. This is a part of it. And we also miss the fact that as a result of the condition of vast categories of people with anomalies, and there are anomalies, you see them frequently, many of them serve with you, is, is that, you know, there are, these folks are disproportionately disadvantaged to the extent that they don't have necessarily the upper leg to be able to even get into this market or others. So I think th those are the conversations I think that we need to frame this stuff in. So definitions are good. I want to keep moving. Um, the development fund is uh, over on uh, page uh, six of 20. Mark, before you move on from definitions. Yes. I'm looking at um, social equity applicant. Yes. And I, am I missing it? It doesn't mention race at all. Where does it, where is it, where, tell me where the. Um... This would be page five, social equity applicant. Social equity applicant means an applicant that meets at least one of the following criteria. Right, but there's no mention of race and in disproportionately right. impacted area, there's also no mention of race. I, I don't know that it would necessarily be uh, in disproportionately impacted areas, uh, but I would think that it would be in uh, social equity. I've noted it and I'll come back to it. Okay. I didn't notice that, yeah. believe it or not. Is this a, a, a bill that's being proposed by Representative China in the House? Is that what, does he have a bill in the House? Yes, this originated oh. with the Racial Justice Alliance and, and it was submitted in the House. Michelle, you're, you're doing like this is making me nervous. Well, um, I just wanted to say the version that you provided to the senators is not the version that uh, that members signed out. So. Well, that's problematic. Can you can you can you get that out to us? Because we we originally the bill originated uh, here. The, the sponsor has it. Um, I can look, it's in the queue uh, for introduction. I don't think it's made it out for introduction yet, but um, I had okay. seen that version and I had a conversation with the sponsor and the language that, some of the language and the, you had changed the dates in there and I was instructed to go back and change them back to the date, so. I, I think we have the, I have the, you know, unless the motivation has changed or, you know, structure has changed. Well, I think we can go from well, what I, what I Thank you so much for that, Michelle. That's helpful. It's just disappointing and it's almost tempting to just terminate this, this uh, testimony right now. Uh, uh, but I'm not going to do that because what I do know is, is that um, the, uh, the difference between the two versions, Michelle, if you can just please uh, help me out here, you don't, without divulging too much, 
but largely, I think that those date, though, it was largely those dates uh, that we were struggling with. Um, and I will attempt to continue unless, unless Michelle thinks no, there's no, more go material. Ahead. No, no it's fine. I just didn't want anyone thinking that that version is the version that's being intro introduced because that's it's, a, it's a different. Okay, that's incredibly helpful. Um, but I but I do think that. Um, All right. Why don't we go? Why don't Why don't we move forward with this version and we'll see. I, I'm trying to. <clears throat> I'm following this version. Um, okay. And I don't know where this committee will come down. If it, I don't. I need to talk to the House members too. If they're taking this bill up um, and we meet in the middle or whatever, but let's follow through with the bill. This is this is the proposal that the Racial Justice Alliance is supportive of. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Can I just should... ask, is this proposed as an amendment to S25 or is this language that's being advanced in a different bill on the other side. Let's consider an amendment to S25. And then we can... in, but in, but uh, if they're introducing a bill on the other side. They, let's, well, Senator, they, um, first, first of all, <laughs> Mr. Chair, if, you, if I may, the, yep. um, to, the answer to, uh, to Senator uh, uh, Benning's question is yes. This has been uh, introduced on the other side, and yes. <laughs> We would like to consider it as amendment. If you will recall, if you will recall, in 2017, with H4 on 92, uh, the bill that would later cross back over in a vehicle called 308 that became that became Act 54, we started work on S16, um, S116, which was on the wall here before H492 crossed over. So this is not unusual work uh, that we're doing here. Well, maybe it is unusual, but it's not unprecedented. So I, I mean, I understand your frustrations, uh, Senator White, not to be too direct, but this is not unprecedented. We Thank did you, this, Mark, we did it in this committee. Mark, can I just pause you for a second? Yes, sir. About a year ago, we were working on a bill that eventually came out and you were trying to get language introduced, and I distinctly recall you and I having a conversation about whether there was time to get language in, uh, given the time frame that we had to operate in. You were frustrated that we couldn't get it in. I think we were all frustrated that we didn't have time to get it in. So a promise was made to have us all take another look trying to figure out a way to plug this conversation back into the mix at some point in time. So when I signed on to S25 originally, I knew that there were provisions that we had to deal with. This morning, I've been wrestling with trying to figure out where you were going. And unfortunately, we didn't have it posted on our website until just a few minutes ago. So I'm hearing that this language is introduced in a bill in the house. I'm also hearing that a portion of this conversation is being dealt with in GovOps. And I'm thinking to myself, we are a week and a half away from crossover if you discount the um, discussion that we've got, um, not the discussion, but the break we're taking next week. And I'm trying to wrestle with how we're gonna do this and we're all looking at the same time frame we had the last time around, which is very frustrating uh -huh. for all of us, you included. Um, so I just want to make clear, this language you're introducing now is something you are requesting as an amendment to S25 yes. in its left draft form. Yep. Well, Senator, um, that is, Senator Benning, if that's the case, the answer, there's no the reason to do yes. The no, yes. Okay. That's all I needed to know. If, if I could edit one. It was, it, was, uh, it was in the email that the, that the that the document was attached to when I sent it to you, it stated very clearly that it was that was I was requesting it as an yep. amendment. Right, and I and if I could add, out. just one thing, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Mark. Mark is saying he wants us to consider it as an amendment. He's also working on it in the House, and as he points out, that's very common to have a vehicle in both bodies, you know, because one can die or one can not make crossover, so. Senator Sears has already said, let's move forward with consideration of this as an amendment. 
Yep. So. Yeah, I, I just don't want to get stuck on process because that's like the last yeah. move before God. You know. I'm suggesting we just get going. <laughs> so, so I want what I'd like to do is, is get going as well. But I just wanted to state, uh, Senator Benning, that your concerns and your observations are precisely the reason why we are approaching it in this manner, because time, because of the false deadlines that have been established by this body that we call crossover, that you know you have rules you can suspend if necessary, uh, but you know, well, let's play within them. Uh, and because we're playing within them, what, you, what we can do here is, is we can just introduce a bill in the house while at the same time, considering as an amendment in the Senate, uh, and the chair seems to be okay with that. So moving Thank on, um, the uh, the um, the area. I think we're at the social. I'm I'm at social equity loans and grants. Or, yeah. Okay, I just wanted to stop, uh, Mr. Chairman, over at the cannabis business development fund. Uh, this is right. language that should not be unfamiliar on page uh, six of 20. Um, and the language is as follows is the fund. And, and just to be clear, the fund is, um, is uh, um, it's comprised of fees collected from integrated uh, licenses. This is pursuant to the last chapter that we're gonna cover. We, got, we have a whole, cover a uh, whole chapter that is it basically mirrors your integrated uh, chapter as well. We'll, go, we'll get to that. It talks about uh, some uh, 200,000 being transferred from the cannabis registration fee fund. It also talks about that 10% um, of revenues raised of the cannabis excise uh, <laughs> tax. Uh, that's not to exceed $2 million. Uh, there's um, a fund that uh, is usually used to, for the following purposes, and, and you can just read that, the low interest grants and, Mark, and loans. Mark, can I just um, ask you a question about that? Would it not make more sense to have, um, to actually have an appropriation ahead of time? If we wanna give uh, loans and grants to people to um, get them on an equal footing, if we wait until there's funds generated, from the revenue, that's after the fact. So, wouldn't it make more sense to have a to ask for an actual appropriation to to um, begin that fund um, beforehand, so that people can have a leg up before things get going? <clears throat> Just to be clear, um, you're talking about general fund. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would, I would, I would leave that to the committee, uh, and as well as you know, I think that this is where our thought process started. Um, we do rely on you for some things, <laughs> so yeah. I mean, I would, I would defer to the committee, and if that seems like uh, a better approach, we we would be a minimal to that because wow. we we have already discussed um, both here and in appropriations pre-funding certain parts of this operation to get things going. So what um, Senator White is talking about would become part of that pre-funding. Um, Correct. And I, I think she makes a good point. I think so too. And, and the other piece of that is, is, and I'll keep it moving, is, is that we've also, and you probably saw a letter that came out from us last week um, asking for a, a, a plate, uh, a holding spot in appropriations for, uh, for, for cannabis. I think, I think it may have been a part of that. I may, I might be mistaken. Don't hold me to that. Go right we keep ahead. moving, uh, to, on keep to moving social along. Social oh. equity loans and grants. Um, I think this, this part is pretty straightforward. We're talking, uh, ACCD, um, these are uh, loans and grants to equity applicants, which are defined in the four in the, in the, in the uh, front here. This is large. Most of this language is largely just uh, emulating, as as Senator uh, Benning, you had said before, that you've seen the Illinois uh, language. This is this is you know it's not cut and paste, but it, it's pretty close to the stuff that they're talking about. There's um, um, charging, collecting. Um, any premiums, fees, charges, costs, 
uh, coordinating assistance under the program with uh, activities of the Vermont Department of Financial Regulation, Agency of Agriculture. This is all stuff that the agency is going to do. I won't, I won't go down that list too much. I am certain that all of the language that I'm covering is in the final, uh, is, is in the actual, um, uh, the one that was actually uh, placed in. If, if it was not, Michelle would, inter would interrupt me. Uh, th th we'll get down to grants made uh, pursuant uh, to this section uh, in section DE beginning. Uh, so, so now we, I'm not going to touch anything on dates because I think what happened is, is there was some confusion on folks were uh, throwing dates out there that were, um, that were, um, you know, pre act 164, they were actually looking at the existing policy when they were trying to line dates up. I think most of these dates uh, should be, you know, May of, May of uh, 2022 or something like that at a minimum, that might be right. I'm gonna keep it moving. I think most of this language here is pretty straightforward. Community social equity program is 10 to 20. Um, and I'm just gonna breeze through that, you know, that it's established. Uh, there, there are, um, you will see um, what we played around with is, is how do we, how do we um, reduce the number of folks that are actually on this? So this is our, that was our final cut, which you saw moving to uh, 12 of 20, um, following through with, um, um, Mark, Yes. if, if I could just uh, echo something I said earlier, uh, even on the social equity program piece, there's no mention of race all the way through this bill. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, I, that just strikes me as bizarre um, because uh, I had- It's not completely bizarre. Um, you know, well, I, think, I, think that, I think that there may be some areas where we can, it's interesting because when you just come out and you say, look, you need to give black people stuff, and then our senator, uh, who's a lawyer, knows that you can't do that uh, because the uh, be because the um, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, you know, you fly in the face of something and then you get reverse discrimination and everybody's hollering. So now we figured out how to create language to do so. And I'm being asked why. No, I, I, I think you're misreading what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm saying that you defined, um, you know, uh, mm -hmm. social equity in the bill without reference to race, it's just reference to, uh, to poverty um, and, and to policing. And mm -hmm. so I understand that could include the BIPOC community, but there's no legal reason why you can't mention uh, race or you know, in the same way that we have all kinds of programs that, are, that, that have a component of that. Um, so I, I just, the reason I say it seems a little bizarre is because this is coming from uh, the most racially sensitive people that I know in Burlington, um, people that I, that I look to for guidance on that area, mm -hmm. I, I feel as though if I had produced this bill without reference to race, people would say, what are you thinking? Um, so I'm, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm reading through it and I'm, every mention of social equity or disproportionately impacted community is, is completely free of the discussion of systemic racism, et cetera. I get you. You got a fair, you got a fair point there. And, and I think we, we struggled really uh, hard with this and, and, I, and I think, and we're not done with it. Uh, it, is, it is introduced as an amendment and there could be nothing more gratifying than a member of uh, Senate Judiciary telling me that we need to talk more about race, trust me. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll, definitely, um, we'll definitely get and maybe we've accomplished what we sought out to accomplish in some ways is, is to, to make them say it. So you said it. Uh, okay. So now it's time for us to, um, to, to, to get to that. You know, we're running out of time, but Senator Bay Ruth, that is really well taken. And I, I appreciate that. Um, that. I really appreciate that. And, and we, we got some work to do here. And you got to understand, even the Racial Justice Alliance, we're trying to figure out, um, you know, how do we position this policy in a way where it's going to be most effective and um, just like everybody else we don't always get it right so we w our hope is to be able to continue to work with the committee to get this this language right and and we're expecting tons of testimony uh, on this as well okay could, could I ask a question mark sure given given these um, concerns and needing to do it right and to get 
um, to continue working on it and getting more testimony. Does it make sense for us to try to push um, this huge, um, these huge issues and amendments through before crossover? Is there a real reason why this needs to actually be passed this um, session or would it make sense for us to continue these conversations in really meaningful ways and work on it and have it ready to be acted on next January by both bodies, because we're talking about some time out anyway before things get um, in, implemented. So I just, I just wondered. So I'm, frankly, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm going to say it. You know, as I always say it, just say it is, is that you know we really what we're talking about is some language <clears throat> that should have been in last biennium, and uh, what we're talking about yeah. is. is um, the fact that, you know, it seems like we always find a reason to wait. Um, and also understanding that the truth is, is that um, whether this moves forward or not, whether we get the testimony and whether this is integrated as a part of the bill is really in the hands of white political and economic power. And you're gonna make that decision at the end of the day. I can tell you whatever I wanna tell you, but you're gonna, you're gonna do what you wanna do. But what I will tell you is, is that, um, enough is enough, we should move this forward and we should stop making up reasons not to do it. Uh, that's, um, that's, that, I think like last, I think if we would have did it last by any, we wouldn't be having this conversation now. I mean, I appreciate what you're saying, Senator White, because if, you know, of course you want to get it right, but then let's not let perfect be the enemy of done. Uh, no, it, no, I it, didn't, it didn't hinder no. you last session. I, I was just at this no, thinking did, that some the, of the egg the, issues were very complicated let's, let's also. Think, there are certain parts of this bill that Mark has proposed that are absolutely part, should be part of this bill. I'm looking at section three of the bill, page five, as introduced of S25, talks about social equity. So everything mm -hmm. here that talks about social equity, I don't see it as being, you know, maybe we can argue about the fees, we can argue about other stuff. I don't see a reason not to have <clears throat> some more expansive language in here whether it's the whole bill or a portion of the bill. Uh, I think we yeah, can do that. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. And, and again, uh, you know, this being the committee, <clears throat> if you established that this was the Committee of Jurisdiction for Racial Equity Issues, then um, I'm gratified that the chair has chimed in on it. Um, and I, I would just say, you know, I'll just take you to section two to enclose on the integrated license piece is really the big deal here is, is notwithstanding provision, uh, uh, this is uh, page 17 of 18. Really, this is just about how do we deal with integrated license? Um, there's, a, um, there's a program uh, that we, you already read about on the, uh, for, on the, on, on the previous pages that um, I told you I was gonna get to this. Um, so there's some fees. Um, there's a $30,000 non-refundable uh, fee for cannabis, the, for uh, the cannabis board. I don't know. I don't know. That, that might be a good swag. Um, but there's also a non-refundable payment of 3% of the dispensary's total sales between a certain period of time or $100,000, whichever yep. is less, being paid into the cannabis con uh, control board and deposited into that that business fund, that business development fund that we talked about earlier in the in this in this policy, okay, and it, yep. it goes on and talks about um, you know conditions for licensing um, conditions uh, at the time of receipt of a conditional license. The dispensary is going to commit to the, the dispensary is going to commit to one of the following: either you know make a contribution of three percent of your total dispensary sales from a certain period. <clears throat> Hundred thousand dollars or less. Make a contribution of three percent of your total sales for another period, or hundred dollars left, whichever is less, for training or education programs uh, at a Vermont community college, uh, or make a donation of hundred thousand dollars or more to a program that provides job training to persons recently incarcerated, or that provides services in disproportionately impacted areas. Okay, and then. Um, Again, you can also participate as or host the cannabis business establishment incubator program approved by ACCD. 
um, and this is um, it that that is in which a dispensary agrees to provide a loan of at least a hundred thousand dollars and a minimum one year mentorship uh, to a cannabis establishment licensee that qualifies that qualifies as a social uh, equity applicant. Okay, um, once we add. BIPOC in there, then that'll make it a little sweeter, right, uh, Senator Beirut? So the, um, I'm gonna conclude there. This is, again, what was floated in the legislature last year. The House Appropriations, Kitty told, God bless her, wish she was still here. And they also had the, they were provided the 15 page document, which was the precursor to this. The House Government Operations Group was offered the 15 page document, which was a precursor to this. You have seen the 15 page document, which was a precursor to this. This was a slight, this is slightly modified in that. So we do have a head start. We're not starting at the beginning. Uh, the governor's already, you know, give, give us a little shove on his non-signing agreement that he he would be in supportive of stuff like this. Um, I believe that um, you know if we, if we take this thing forward, if we can if we can corral on the other side uh, folks on this ag piece at the same time, pull my colleagues in and 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 Senator White, I do agree with one thing that that you you many things that you said, but what in particular is is that you know regarding the ag piece. Um, we're ride or die. So if they if they're not going with us, we don't want to go. Okay. So as far as how we want to put this whole thing together, I'm pretty sure that if the, if the will is in this committee, because this is room one in the big house, um, if the will is in this committee, if the will the political will is in this committee, then I think we can make it happen. But I am urging you, I'm imploring you, and I am kindly requesting your support uh, on, on this particular amendment uh, to, to, uh, to S25 and also your political capital uh, across the state house to, uh, to bring your colleagues in the line with the work that we're trying to do. I appreciate your time. I'm glad to take any other questions. Any questions for Mark? Thank you. Okay, thanks Mark. I appreciate Should your it. time. It's always good to be here. Um, yeah, nice to talk with you and I, um, I think, again, if you look at Section 3 of the bill as introduced, obviously, April 1st, 2021 doesn't work either. Um, the, so, uh, uh, Michelle will tell you that the, the dates are what is, is are generally jacked on the on this bad okay. copy of the bill. Uh, well, so. we can get, um, we can certainly. I understand the thrust of the bill. The wording may not be perfect. Um, the House bill I'm talking about now. So, um, uh, appreciate the testimony. We're going to take a short break and then come back to hear from um, some other witnesses. And I've lost my agenda.